Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we are going to review with you another horrible case. Before starting the story, I want to apologize for my bad English. I am not a native speaker. However, I am trying my best for you guys. Thanks for your understanding. Acts committed foolishly and because of the young age, sometimes can break the entire future life and have the most unpredictable, even tragic consequences. In the story known as The Case of Daisy Coleman, intertwined the fate of several young girls who became victims of their own naivety and carelessness. They believed that this will soon be forgotten and life will return to its former course, but they were wrong. Each of the schoolgirls was subjected to cruel bullying by classmates and those whom they used to consider friends. In 2016, a documentary called Audrey and Daisy told the stories of girls who were victims of violence and bullying. These stories took place in different places and at different times, and the girls did not even know each other. But the picture clearly showed that psychological violence is often more difficult to survive than physical violence. But let's start at the beginning. The Coleman family. It was a large, friendly, and quite happy family which could be called exemplary. They lived in the small town of Albany, Missouri, Spouses Michael and Melinda were married for many years and raised four children together, sons, Charlie, Tristan, and Logan, as well as a daughter, Daisy. She was the second child and the only girl in the family. Both parents worked in the medical field. Only Michael was a surgeon and his wife a veterinarian. They were considered respected people in their town. All family members were sports fans and cheered for local teams. In 2009, when Daisy was 12 years old, she and her father and older brother traveled by car to a neighboring town to attend a soccer game. However, the weather turned bad that day, and the car skidded on the wet road, resulting in a collision with a car that was traveling in the oncoming lane. The father of the family died on the spot, but the children fortunately were not seriously injured. The Coleman family was bereaved, and they soon decided to move to another city for a change of scenery. The family settled in Maryville, still in the same state of Missouri, where the children went to one of the local schools, and the mother got a job at a veterinary center. Gradually, they recovered from the loss and began to make plans for the future. Daisy was actively engaged in dancing and gymnastics, and was also a member of the school cheerleading team. In addition, the girl discovered another talent. She drew very beautifully and dreamed of becoming an artist or designer in the future. At school, she had many friends who characterized her as bright, kind, open, and cheerful. Daisy had a best friend named Paige, with whom they were practically inseparable. The girls went to school together, were on the same cheerleading team, and attended the same dance studio. They often stayed overnight at each other's houses, which became a common occurrence. On January 7, 2012, when school was on winter break, Paige once again stayed overnight at her friend's house. They watched movies, ate sweets, and chatted. And when everyone went to bed, Daisy sneaked down to the home wine cabinet and stole a bottle of hot liquor from there, which she and her friend drank. After midnight, Daisy began texting a local hottie, 17-year-old Matthew Barnett, who was considered one of the most popular guys in school and was an up-and-coming soccer player. He was friends with her older brother, Charlie, with whom they were in the same class and often visited the Coleman family home. Daisy was flattered by the attention of a grown boy and she was eager to chat and flirt with him. When she wrote that she was spending the night with a friend, Matthew invited the girls to a party at his house, suggesting that they have fun without their parents. They eagerly accepted his offer and quietly left the house, escaping through Daisy's bedroom window. Soon Matthew and his buddy came to pick them up and the young men headed to his house where several other kids from their school were waiting for them. Nightmare party. The party was held in the basement of the house, which the young people got into through the garage. As soon as Daisy and Paige went inside, they were offered alcoholic cocktails that the guys had made themselves. Matthew was particularly persistent. He poured Daisy one drink after another, and she drank it eagerly, trying to impress him. At one point, Paige tried to intervene because she thought her friend was already pretty drunk but she was asked to stay out of it. At the party was a guy named Nicholas, whom Paige had long had a crush on. 
He approached her and started flirting with her. They drank together, and afterward, the high schooler offered her privacy in another room. Paige agreed, realizing what would happen next. Their intimacy didn't last long, and when they went back inside, Daisy wasn't in the large room. The door of the next room where the bed was was slightly ajar, and Paige saw that her friend was lying there almost unconscious, and Matthew, taking advantage of her condition, had become intimate with her. In addition, another member of the party, named Jordan, was filming what was happening on his cell phone. As it later turned out, he also took advantage of Daisy's unconsciousness and had sexual intercourse with her. The boys put the girls in the car and drove them back to Daisy's house. Paige had sobered up a little by then, but her friend was still half-conscious and unable to stand on her own. Soon, Daisy started throwing up, and the guys literally dragged her out of the car. While Daisy was vomiting, Matthew tried to gather her hair, but he was not doing a good job. Daisy's hair and clothes ended up soiled. The guys told Paige to go inside, and they would stay with her friend until she sobered up a bit. Paige believed them, and went back into the room through the window without waking anyone. She laid down on the bed, and since she was still drunk, fell asleep right away. In fact, the boys tricked Paige, and as soon as she returned to the house, they left Daisy lying on the cold ground on a January night, having first taken off her jacket. They later explained their actions by saying that they were afraid someone would see them with a drunken minor and call the police. They allegedly took off the jacket because Daisy was vomiting and had soiled it. Apparently, Daisy lay outside in sub-zero temperatures for several hours before she came to her senses. According to her recollection, at first she thought she was dead because she couldn't feel her limbs, couldn't move or scream. She was also not wearing shoes or socks, but no one could explain where they had gone. Her wet hair was frozen to the lawn and she had to make an effort to lift her head and look around. Daisy crawled to the doorstep of her own house and slammed her hand on the front door several times. Somehow Malene's mother woke up from the noise and thinking it was the dog asking to come inside, went to open the door. Melinda almost lost her senses when she saw her daughter lying on the porch in a helpless and semi-conscious state, undressed and without shoes. The mother shouted and woke her sons, who immediately rushed over and helped to carry her sister into the house. She was wearing only a t-shirt and thin pants, and her limbs showed signs of frostbite. Daisy could not speak, but only sobbed occasionally. She was shaking violently and smelled of alcohol. At first, the mother tried to keep her daughter warm by wrapping her in blankets, but quickly realized that it wouldn't help, so she told her sons to carry her sister into the bathtub. There, Melinda began removing her daughter's clothes and saw that her thighs were covered on the inside with bruises and abrasions. She immediately realized that her daughter had been abused and called the police and medics. Until they arrived, the mother warmed Daisy with warm water. As a medical professional, she knew what to do in such cases to avoid harm and minimize the negative effects of frostbite. At the hospital, Daisy's condition raised serious concerns. Tests showed that her blood alcohol level was twice as high as normal. Her body showed signs of frostbite, as well as the consequences of rough intercourse with bruises and lacerations in the perineum. It was impossible to interrogate Daisy because the events of the previous night had been almost completely erased from her memory. Then the police decided to question Paige, who told them everything that had happened to them. The friends admitted that they took a bottle of alcohol in the home bar without permission, hoping that no one would notice it. The contents of the bottle they managed to drink, so when the guys invited them to their home, they were already drunk. Paige had told them about the intimacy and that Jordan had videotaped what Matthew had done to the unconscious Daisy. Now it was necessary to interrogate the guys, study the video, and find the victim's cell phone, which she didn't have with her. After searching the grounds of the house, the police found Daisy's gadget in the snow on the lawn. The phone saved her correspondence with Matthew, which was quite intimate. The very next day, all three boys were taken to the police station for questioning. Matthew confessed that he had organized a party in his house, to which he invited two girls. He confirmed that the girlfriends were already drunk when they came to them, but they, according to him, were aware of their actions. 
understood what was going on and willingly agreed to everything. At first, Matthew categorically denied that he had bought Daisy a drink, but soon began to confuse his own testimony and confessed that he poured her alcohol to melt the ice in her heart. But he insisted that Daisy was conscious during the intimacy and that it was consensual, using contraception. Matthew went on to say that he drove Daisy and Paige home. Daisy felt sick. She was vomiting. And then he decided to take off her jacket so she wouldn't get dirty. Her shoes, he reasoned, she had taken off by herself for some reason. The young man assured that when he and his friends left, they were sure that Daisy had gone to her house. Jordan admitted that he filmed Matthew and Daisy's intimacy on his phone and even managed to show the video to a few friends, but then decided to delete it. Nicholas also admitted that he and Paige had sexual intercourse and noted that she was okay with it. After questioning, all three guys were taken into custody. Nicholas was the only one who did not deny, cooperated with the police, and confessed to everything, and was the first one who was immediately sent to a juvenile detention center. Detectives found the situation with his friends less clear-cut. The local sheriff sided with Matthew and even praised him for taking the girls home, but the sheriff deliberately omitted the fact that one of the friends was left in the cold in a semi-conscious state, previously undressed. Also, for some unknown reason, the video, which was filmed by Jordan, and which could have helped to shed light on the state in which Daisy was during the intimacy, was not even tried to restore, considering this detail irrelevant. Crucial to the trial was Daisy's testimony, which she gave on the very first day she was in hospital. She did not, as I said, remember the events of that night, but when asked by a police officer whether she herself could have offered intimacy in exchange for alcohol, Daisy allowed for that possibility. Later, Coleman denied this, saying she didn't hear the question and was still not well aware of what was going on. But this verbal trap allowed the charges against Matthew and Jordan to be dropped. In addition, as it turns out, Matthew Barnett's grandfather, who was once a police officer himself and later went into politics and became a state representative, became involved. Moreover, the sheriff, who empathized with the guys, noted in court that he did not consider the girls to be victims at all. In the end, the young men were acquitted and released from the courtroom. Physically, Daisy recovered a few weeks after those terrible events, but mentally, she remained a wreck. Daisy went back to school, hoping to return to a normal life, but instead of support and sympathy, she faced severe peer bullying. Most of the students took the side of the popular handsome Matthew, and Daisy and Paige were called liars and easy girls, ready to give themselves for a bottle of alcohol. Coleman was kicked off the school cheerleading squad and literally became a pariah everywhere she went, even though her brothers tried to stick up for her. Daisy regularly received anonymous calls and texts that were abusive or threatening, and her mother received similar messages. Her best friend and her mother stopped communicating because she was also a victim of bullying and had to transfer to another school. Gradually, Daisy fell into a deep depression, began to avoid any contact with others, and even tried to settle accounts with life. The last straw was the arson of the Coleman's house, after which they finally convinced themselves that it was simply not safe for them to stay in the city and decided to move to another state where Daisy could normally finish school. A few years later, when Daisy was already in college, an influential online publication publicized her story and once again drew public interest in Daisy. This time, however, a host of people across the country, many of whom had experienced something similar or had also been victims of bullying stepped forward to speak up for her. And soon, a documentary film, Audrey and Daisy, was made, raising the issue of violence, harassment, and bullying. The second character in the story was a girl named Audrey Pott, who lived in California. A similar story happened to her at about the same young age, after which she also became an outcast. The schoolgirl fell into a depression from which she could no longer get out of and took her own life. Before leaving, she wrote on her internet page that her life was destroyed, and she saw no point in hanging on to it any longer. This documentary project and the public support it received inspired the Coleman family to continue to fight for justice and get the investigation reopened. This time, 
Matthew Barnett was still found guilty, but was sentenced to only four months of probation, and he also paid the victim a laughable amount of less than $2,000. After graduating from college, Daisy moved to Colorado, where she planned to start her life with a clean slate. She found a use for her talent as an artist, taking a job as a master at a tattoo parlor. At the same time, Daisy was offered to take part in another documentary project, and she readily accepted. For a while, it seemed to her that everything was getting better, but in the summer of 2018, trouble came to her family again. Mom and younger brother Tristan decided to visit Daisy and went to her by car. But on the way to another state, they got into a car accident as a result of which the young man died on the spot, and Melinda was taken to the hospital with serious injuries. This tragedy undermined Daisy's already unstable emotional state. She became withdrawn again, didn't want to socialize with anyone, and withdrew into herself. On top of that, she learned that she would never be able to have children. She was saved from a desperate step only by her favorite work and creativity and she reflected her pain and fears in drawings and sketches. Soon, Daisy began to complain that a stranger was stalking her. She again received threatening and abusive messages, but worst of all, he repeatedly came to her house. She began to feel as if a nightmare from her past life had returned to drive her completely insane. Coleman went to the police several times, talking about the mysterious stalker and that she felt threatened by him, but her statements went unheeded. In addition, Daisy discovered that the second key to her house was missing and assumed that the man stalking her had stolen it. On August 4, 2020, police arrived at Daisy's house, called by Melinda. She couldn't reach her daughter and assumed the worst, so she called for help, asking the police to drive over and see if everything was okay. Daisy was home and admitted she was very scared. But the police found no intruders, either in the house or nearby, and so quickly left. A couple hours later, Daisy called her boyfriend via video link. She was crying, talking about how she couldn't take it anymore, and then pulled a gun out of her desk drawer and shot herself. The guy immediately reported the incident to the emergency services and went to his beloved, but it was too late. Daisy died at the age of 23. Daisy became the third member of the family to pass away prematurely. Her mother, Melinda, couldn't come to terms with the loss. She posted almost daily on social media reminiscing about her daughter, apologizing to her, and saying she wished she could take her pain on herself. A few months later, the 58-year-old woman left one last post with an old photo of all her children together. She admitted that she couldn't bear to live with the pain, and afterward, she voluntarily left this world shooting herself just as her daughter had done. Of the once large, loving, and happy family of six, only brothers Charlie and Logan remained. When they wanted to take some of their sister's belongings as a memento of her, it turned out that the salon where she worked had been robbed and the albums with her exclusive sketches were stolen. As for Matthew Barnett, his life is quite successful now. He graduated from a prestigious college and decided to follow in the footsteps of his influential grandfather. When Matthew learned about the death of his mother and daughter Coleman, he dryly expressed his condolences on his page on the internet. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.